All right, we're going to get started. Uh, so, my name is Tom Mullaney, and I teach in the History Department and direct the UH Asia. And it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to the fourth installation out of five. Uh, this is our penultimate residency, and we're delighted to have Javier Cha with us. Uh, Javier is a uh, postdoctoral fellow, right now, let me not get this wrong, in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures at the University of Hong Kong, having received his PhD from Harvard in, I believe, 2014. And uh, if anyone is interested in having a look at uh, the dissertation, The Civilizing Project in Medieval Korea, Neoclassicism, Nativism, and Figurations of Power by Javier Cha, uh, we have a review of that. Um, of his dissertation on dissertation reviews. It's a pretty, it's a pretty substantial review. It gives a nice introduction. Although, as I understand it, what we're hearing from today is an outgrowth that comes from maybe one core chapter of the dissertation. So what we're hearing today is, uh, is Dr. Cha moving in a direction that um, may see the light of publication even before uh, this book, this dissertation becomes a book, or maybe two books will come out at the exact same time and he will go instantly to full professor. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm ready for. Uh, so for those of you not familiar, if you're first time visitors to BH Asia, uh, this is where we are in the series. This is the 2016 uh, inaugural DH Asia framework. Uh, the format is the same as always. Today's Tuesday lecture is a public lecture uh, on research in progress, uh, which are the manifestations of one or another or set of digital humanities tools and methods. Um, so we have a kind of a mixture of the interpretive outcomes of this research, but also with an attention of how this research was built. And we have, that's why we have these beautiful uh, uh, large scale, large format printouts around the table. Um, I was delighted to learn that Dr. Cha is a man of paper. Uh, so this is very kind of hi-fi and lo-fi all in one. On Thursday, uh, I don't know why I just made the number four. On Thursday, we're going to have the workshop, which is always the second part of the DH Asia residency. And so uh, if you do want to take part in that, uh, Dr. Cha is going to be moving us through the platform of Cytoscape, um, which you see some up here. Uh, originally designed, I guess, for uh, in bioinformatics for protein chains and these sorts of things, but people have realized it also works very well when thinking about family genealogies, marriage networks, and, and whatnot. So on, if you do want to sign up for that, which is signed Visualization and Analysis of Korean Genealogical Data Using Cytoscape, although in, in reality we could also think of it as Visualization and Analysis of Blank Genealogical Data Using Cytoscape. If someone works here on China, Japan, Middle East, it doesn't matter as much. Um, uh, that will be happening on Thursday, April 28th at 1.30 here, but registration is required. And if anyone has any questions about that, please let me know and I'll send you the, um, the registration link. So without, um, and I do want to make just a, a set of thank yous. I, I want to begin by thanking the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis, who is a main uh, supporter of DH Asia, but also um, for uh, Javier's visits, I really want to thank both my colleagues in, in history and literature and also uh, see Centerpiece Asian Studies more broadly because, um, because of how many people you appeal to, it was like falling off a log to get more people involved in help bring, helping uh, to bring you out. So uh, please join me in welcoming Javier Cha. and uh, gave me a real opportunity to uh, work on uh, this set of data that uh, I've been meaning to uh, work on for many, many years. And this DHH Asia Startup gave me a great excuse to uh, spend the last three or four months just on cleaning up and trying to visualize uh, the graph that you see here in, in large format. It really accelerated the process so that I think uh, this, this book it's going to be a short book, but I think this book will come out before my dissertation. So, uh, as Professor Mulaney mentioned, today I will talk uh, for about 40, 45 minutes uh, about what is going on in these posters, right, in these network graphs, right? And on Thursday, if you're interested, uh, 
uh, I'll, we'll spend about two to and a half hours, I think, back in this room, uh, and I'll show you how you can create network graphs like this yourself. Right? And if you don't have a, a, a data set yourself, I can provide a data set. It'll be kind of like a cooking show, right? So <laughs> we'll go from sources to creating data sets, right? And then when you're done with maybe like seven to eight entries, I'll say, okay, done. I'll give you the data set, right? the file, and then you start playing with the visualization. So uh, this project that is, looks like it's going to become a book, right? uh, is it grew out of something that uh, drew me into the humanities. So in, in about 11, 12 years ago, I was very torn because I was, a, I was an undergraduate student, and I was thinking of pursuing a career in the IT industry. I was coding. Right? And, uh, and I made this major life decision, right? I decided to abandon that career and then become a historian. And somewhere in the middle of my graduate school career, uh, I realized that to answer the question uh, that drew me to uh, academia, I had to use software to answer that question. <laughs> so the question for me was a very simple one, uh, and usually I think in the humanities, as you would know, uh, simple questions tend to be the most complicated one. So my simple question was uh, uh, localization of Confucian tradition in Korea. Why did Korea become a Confucian country um, sometime in between uh, 1100 and 1500? So there are two major ways of looking at this question. One is to uh, look at it in a, in a Eurasian scale, right? Uh, so what is interesting is that the particular type of Confucian thought I was pursuing is a, is a neoclassical and nativist version that grew out of some urban centers in this part of the world, right, around the 11th century. Right? And what's interesting is that this was a time when you can say, well, very broadly speaking, the world is divided into the Islamic part of the world and the Buddhist world. And even though scholars of historians of Confucian thought like to portray this as a time of Confucian revival, was the most important thing going at the time, the societies in this part of East Asia uh, was predominantly Buddhist. <coughs> and within that world, there were pockets where intellectuals were active, and they were trying to uh, resist the influence of Buddhism, trying to contain it, and pursue an agenda that was uh, that was uh, the, the, the long-term goal was to uh, restore Confucian rule, uh, or at least their version of Confucian rule, in uh, in the Northern Song and Korea here. And what is interesting is that this doesn't spread anywhere else, as far as I know. It only happened in China and in Korea. So uh, I will. I begin my talk starting uh, with a, a definition of Confucianism. And uh, because I'm a historian, my definition will be on a timeline. So what we call Confucianism, right? And uh, sometimes when you see scholars of um, Chinese intellectual history, they say that Confucianism is a, a Jesuit construct. Right? It's actually a one version that uh, uh, some intellectual historians accept, but in the case of Korea, um, whether you agree with that uh, view or not, it doesn't quite work because uh, there were no Jesuits active in the Korean Peninsula. But there is one predominant version of what is Confucianism that follows uh, this formula. And it's a construct created by Japanese colonial scholars and one particular ideologue named Takahashi Tori. And the version that he created was one that was uh, divided into dynasties. So there was an early period. There was Korea, so that goes from 918 to 1392. And there's Kosan. 1990 to 
So in this version, you get that early was native religion. It gets displaced by Buddhism in Korea. And then that gets displaced by Confucianism. And then you have a new agenda under Japanese rule. Right? So every dynastic change goes through uh, a shift in basically the way the whole nation uh, thinks what should be the state religion. Right? So the, one of the, the rationale behind saying this is that the Koreans, since very early times, kind of lost its own native religion. It, it didn't have its own national character. It kept replacing, as passive recipients, kept replacing its own religion uh, every time there was a regime change. Okay. When I first started grad school, uh, I started doing a literature review, right? And from early on, I had trouble buying this narrative, right? And it's, there were many versions of this. And interestingly, this is actually more or less a narrative that we continue, we, we still see today at the undergraduate level, right? When we, when we teach uh, history, Chinese thought, Chinese intellect, I mean, Korean intellectual history, we see some version of this being taught even today, right? But as I did a literature review, I found that there's another way of looking at it. And this is the version that I, I created to teach undergraduates in the University of Hong Kong, a version that looks a little more like this, right? This is still a simplification, but it doesn't, respect dynastic boundaries, right? doesn't follow dynastic periodization, right? And there are actually multiple things going on at the same time. And if you think about it, it's actually very, it's commonsensical, right? There's no such thing as, you know, regime change leading to a full-scale ideological religious change in the whole society, right? Of course, the coexistence of Confucianism of, and in Buddhism, and of course, what we call Confucianism is actually many, many things, right? So the Please bear with me because I'm an intellectual historian and I have to explain ideas first, right? And because it's a DH seminar, uh, we're gonna go from kind of like referencing the lunchtime discussion we had, something that's full of meaning, right? So it can be, you know, some, you might already hate it, I don't know. But something that's full of meaning into something that's more and more meaningless, right? So I talk about ideas, a lot of ideas. If you don't care, just, you know, tune it out, right? And eventually I'll get to what's the relationship between all these ideas and these networks. Okay. So the version of Confucianism I come up with looks kind of like this. <coughs> and the reason I do this is because uh, I'm a historian who happens to follow um, the anal notion of total history. So I take one question and try to attack it from as many different angles as possible. Right? So the first version, the first angle I'm going to go for is uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, in, from the perspective of history of philosophy and history of literature. Okay? So the version that we get is around the year. 1,000, we get uh, what is usually called a neoclassical Buwen Confucianism enter Korea around this time. Okay. And this goes on well into the year 1500. Sometime around uh, the year 1500, we get many regional versions of Confucianism. Uh, and this follows what is usually called Neo-Confucianism. And without going into too many details, it was uh, regionally very diverse and uh, very locally oriented. Whereas the version that we see in Neo-Confucianism was nationally oriented and state-centric. So another, first, another way of looking at this is to see uh, how the dynamics change in the flow of information. Right? I noticed that in SESTA, because uh, usually when I draw maps like this, 
people laugh, but I know it's in Zesta, this is actually very common. I see it everywhere. I don't like it. But there was, a, there was a fundamental shift in the way books and inf uh, information flow in, uh, in the years 1100s and 1400s, 1500s. So in the ele year 1100s, uh, I don't know if uh, Hilda mentioned this, there was a restriction on uh, book trade and information flows in the Northern Song in the 1100s. Because there was a conflict between the Liao and the Song. And this conflict opened doors for Koreans to enter China and be able to acquire books in large amounts. So Song gave permission to the Korean merchants. So the way the Koreans encounter Confucianism is by direct encounter and they got to travel to the capital and access the book markets here. Whereas in the years uh, 1400, 1500s, there were many movements in China, this part and this part, right? And this had to go through the mediation of the political capital in Beijing. And from there, through tributary missions, books entered the capital, right? And from there, if the people in the capital chose to share certain books. They went to uh, southern and northern regions of Korea. That was the flow, right? So what happened was, in the northern song, in, in, in the years 1400s, 1500s, you have uh, a major literary movement from here, and the book, uh, and, and these people served as officials here, published their books, and these books enter here. But what's interesting is that this movement is popular in the capital, but not in the provinces, in part because it didn't appeal to them, and also because uh, uh, these books were monopolized by the group here, by the people here. Whereas there is um, what is usually called learning of the mind movement. You don't have to worry about this term, it's just you know, my, my field on jargon, right? Another movement that also has books published in Beijing, and these enter the capital. But in this case, this becomes very, very popular in the southern parts of Korea. And as this happened, for some reason, people here, people here, and actually it's another community further south, they, they develop into distinct schools of thought. Yes? Uh, a minute ago when you, you were pointing at the Ming map, and you said Song, and said that it was monopolized in the capital. Um, are we all talking about two different waves, or two different two types of waves, book? Yeah. Is it Song? Is yeah, yeah, yeah. So, our, uh, so we're talking about the Ming, though, and there's two different types of book trade, one from capital to capital, and one from capital that spreads out yeah, in Yeah, but capital to the provinces is not really trade. It's more about restriction. Okay. And appeal. Thank you for interrupting. I, I forgot to mention that we're operating on DH convention. So if anything, anything sounds clear, just feel free to interrupt me. Right? I, I like that. So this is in the realm of ideas and um, information flow, right? So first, I try to tackle it from the perspective of literary history and history of ideas, and then I try to approach it from the, his, uh, from the perspective of uh, history of book trade and history of reading, right? And then the next step, I try to pursue from the perspective of uh, who were the personalities and communities involved in this process, right? So I'm defining Confucianism, again, in, from the on a timeline as a process. It's always changing, right? And depending on which period, which year you're pointing at, and which region, the definition is different. You're pointing at different schools of thought, right? different pursuits. So same timeline, I try to discover assemblages of certain people, 
who were engaged in this kind of intellectual activity. So if you, uh, there's no way I can explain all this in a, such a short time period. If you, if the ideas are confusing, that's okay. What we're focusing on today are the communities, the people that appear in these networks, okay? So the people we're talking about here are the Yangban. Right? So if you know something about Korean history, the Yangban are the educated elite, the political elite of Korea that appear around the year 1000. And the, the definition of Yangban changes over time. Okay? Obviously, in history, everything changes over time. But the, the stock definition, the, 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 the semantic definition of Yangban is two ranks. And two ranks refer to uh, service in the central government's uh, civil and military offices. Okay? That's the main definition. But uh, the nature of what is Yangban status changes over time because if you look at the Yangban in the year 1000, you see that there are certain people who have a great, uh, a great amount of power, right? And this power does not last for more than two or three generations. Whereas around the year 1400 onwards, you see that the number of Yangban expands and they're, uh, they're connected to each other in a robust way that shares power, but they, they're remarkably good at preserving the power within their in-group. Does this make sense? Okay. So I wanted to uh, see this in the form of marriage networks, because in the literature, we see uh, case studies. Uh, case studies of certain powerful individuals and maybe two or three at most powerful families. And then from there, I have this hint that these people were trying to preserve their power by marrying, getting married to the right people. But what I wanted to do is not being restricted to just two or three families. I wanted to see a much larger scale. Okay? And hence, this visualization. Okay? May I ask a question? Yes, sure. So Korea dynasties say that there is an aristocracy Hereditary is very really strong in comparison to the hereditary aristocracy. So yes, people yes. say the Korea dynasty the aristocratic, <coughs> right? Yeah. And then his Yangban, two ranks, you said two generations, and it's a bit more, more flexible social mm -hmm. group or ruling class. Mm -hmm. So how do they combine with each other in the Korea context? In the Joseon dynasty, people said the Yangban has a hybrid character, this aristocratic characters yes, yes. and a little bit of this. Um, mobility, and like that. But here, if Yangban emerged in 1000, one, one you know, that period, then how this related to the hereditary tradition? That's a great question, but that also means I have to add one more okay. element to this timeline, which is the year 900. Uh, I wasn't sure if I should go there, right? There was a change in regime here, and in this case, the regime change resulted in a major structural change. So it was a shift from Shilla to Korea. And the difference is that Shilla had an aristocratic system that was legislated. So it was hereditary aristocracy, but your status was guaranteed by law. Right? When you were born, you were always already prescribed what kind of clothing you should wear, where your rank is, where you should reside. Everything was determined for you. Korea when this regime change happened, because Shilla's legislative aristocracy did not share power with outsider groups, when the regime toppled, the people who founded Korea were non-aristocratic elements of the Shilla regime. So the problem was, you have a new dynasty, new regime, and you wanted to create an aristocracy, but your ans you cannot claim that your ancestors were aristocrats. So they create this uh, a de facto regime, and they wanted to create a stable regime out of this. So the system that came up with was, you become an aristocrat, you become ennobled, once you achieve uh, a certain bureaucratic rank, then you become recognized as an aristocratic group. The problem was that they didn't respect certain customs that became very normal by the Joseon dynasty. And one of that was marriage. Right? So, in a way, uh, once you become powerful in Korea, you are allowed to
marrying, marrying, so you're allowed to marry and keep marrying people who are your close kin, people who are your close associates, because there were no restrictions uh, observed as to uh, who you can marry. Right? So power was concentrated in certain groups, and once you had a conflict and that, per that, that, uh, that group was wiped out, then the whole family was gone. So the regime was very unstable, right? And it was a kind of aristocracy where um, certain families became very, very powerful, but they had a lot of trouble preserving their power for more than two or three generations. And this shows up when I look at the marriage network data, and also when I check um, uh, genealogies, and when I check their epitaphs. And it actually gets uh, proven when I look at um, John Duncan's data. So there's a great deal of continuity here in Duncan data, but there's discontinuity here. A lot of discontinuity is seen. So one example of that, let's get to the visualization. Right? It becomes a, I don't want to get dwell too much on uh, Korean history talk, right? So here, you have an example of marriage network in the year 1100. Okay, we have three major um, households, right? For about I think about five or six generations represented here. Okay, so the red, do you all have this? Same one. Yeah. The red is the dynastic house, right? And the green is uh, the in-law family. And the blue is another aristocratic family, but not as powerful as the green family. Okay. And the solid lines represent a father-to-son relationship. And the double lines represent uh, marriage, okay? Eagle to son-in-law, okay? And the, what do you call it, the slashes? That's marriage that represents connection to the royal house, right? So what I want you to pay attention to is all the dynastic mar uh, uh, marriages to the royal house, right? And notice that the green house continues to marry the same family, the same dynastic family. Okay. There's monopoly of power going on here. Okay? I hope you see the same thing I see. Yes. It's this one, 1100s. And this was 14. You can take that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Can, you can you walk us through that one more time? Yes. So here, you have the dynastic house, right? These are kings of Korea, okay? And here, you have the most powerful aristocratic family in the years uh, 1100, okay? And here, you have the Heju Chui, another powerful aristocratic family, but not as powerful as the green family, okay? And I want you to notice that, first of all, the blue family continues to marry, right, the green family. And the red dynastic house family, right, establishes marriage only with the green family, right? So once there's a struggle in the court and the green family is wiped out, the family is gone, disappears from the records. And the only reason I could reconstruct this is because we have a bundle of um, epitaphs that survive, right? So because they have, no, they, they have no descendants, their writings don't survive to us. But the only reason I could reconstruct this is because their tombstones survive to us. The tombstones lay out very clearly uh, who their associates are, who their in-laws are, who they're married to. Okay. So we could reconstruct this. Okay. But this is also another problem of doing a history of this period. We don't have that many records because their descendants are not there anymore. Right? It's a very interesting period. Right? People who are really powerful, Right? And you see this references for about two, one or two lines that says like they had this humongous houses, this mansion decorated with gold and celadon, right? Then you wonder what happened to these people, right? Their children are not there around anymore to preserve uh, their artifacts. And now I want you to take a look at the year 1400s. So these are also very, very powerful families, high-ranking officials about the equip, uh, about the equivalent Yangban status as these three families here, right? And notice the shape, the connections, 
everything is very, very different. Okay? Again, solid line means father to son, and double lines mean marriage. Okay. Can you walk us through the differences? So if you look at here, I know in part it's the layout algorithm, right? But you notice that there are three distinct parallel features going on here, right? The patterns, right? Parallel, they're, they're following some kind of parallel arrangement, right? But here, we see that there are six different families, right? They are close associates, right? But they cannot marry certain people. They want to uh, be part of the in-group. They want to pick a marriage partner within their group, but they are observing Confucian law, Confucian regulation, which is that if, if you're within, so you cannot marry, I think in English, second order, second cousin, right? So they're they're observing that, right? So in a way, the marriage, marriage, marriage restriction is forcing them to disperse power into a much larger group. So in this case, if something happens to the family because of, uh, I don't know, maybe you're accused of treason and you're executed and then your associates are wiped out as well, at least certain segments of your family still uh, survives, right? But power is a lot more dispersed compared to this period here, okay? Is that, is that normalized in some sense for the number of surviving sources from the two different periods? Are there more dots on that because there are more epitaphs or more sources than there are on the first? Is there some way there to make There are more sources, yeah. And uh, so that was a, a question I had as well. So I, want, I wanted to get at a, a much larger source. So this is, where, this is reconstructed from six genealogies, right? So I wanted to get to a much larger source, which is, uh, the exam database. Okay. So in this case, uh, the young man to become a civil official especially had to pass what is called the civil service examination. Right? And in the case of uh, Joseon Dynasty in Korea, the, the records are, uh, they've survived in a partial way, but from 1392 onwards, we have the full roster. And it looks something like this here. This is one example. Again, it's digitized by the Academic Korean Studies and <coughs> uh, full text version like this, right? On Thursday, right? On Thursday, I'll also show you how you can um, uh, scrape this using a macro, right? In case you want to turn a database that looks like this into uh, a spreadsheet. But basically, records that look like this became that other digitized version, and it shows um, the name, the position they held, uh, or oh, the position they held. I think these are uh, their sovereignty and pseudonym, and uh, where they're from, and then information about their family. Notes, basically, right? So from this, uh, and there's also information about, uh, in some cases, who their uh, father, grandfather, and maternal grandfather and father-in-law were. So from the information of a father-in-law and maternal grandfather, we can reconstruct their marriage connection. Okay. So what I did is I took this data set, right, scraped it, and because the, uh, sometimes there are rare Chinese characters and sometimes um, things break, right? So there are a lot of things that need to be cleaned up. Uh, in this case, I think the cleanup took me about two months. <laughs> but once I finished cleaning up, I got to visualize it in Cytoscape. And it looks something like this one I didn't print because I wanted to show you and move on. Hmm. 
have one here. Yeah, this is a, an older version of Washington. This is the first 70 years of the extant database. Okay? And you see that uh, in Gephi, they call this the giant component. Right? It's like the, the big ball there, right? But it's not exactly just a hairball of randomness. These are all interconnected. Right? Uh, so in a way, uh, the Yangban in the first 70 years of Joseon Dynasty, they are connected to each other in a very loose way. Right? But the interesting thing is that once you start measuring this on, on the software, is that something like 70 to 80 percent of the people represented in the data set are connected to each other in this giant component? And to me, this is my way of defining what is a Yangban in the early chosen context. It's belonging to this. Right? Because what gets interesting is that once I start looking at regional variations in intellectual culture, you see that people in the southeast, they're not there. Some of them don't even. They're not even here. They don't even take the exam. Right? And sometimes people who are very, very famous, uh, you see that they are not part of this giant component in the middle, in, in, at the top. And to me, that was very fascinating because we're seeing that these intellectual differences in culture is also uh, uh, there's a parallel in the in basically the way the people were assembled in society. So in the bottom, that means that the bottoms are not connected. That's not, the bottom version of that is not a- Small connections and they're not attached to. And that is, so that is one entity, that the bottom is not an elaborate, it's not a sort of a piecing apart of the hairs of the hairball. That is, that is, that is one apart. diagram, they're apart, I see. Yeah. I don't, I don't see, so what the balls, what, what, what's the connection? What made that giant ball? So, so what, what's the tie? So the, the Yangban are reinforcing each other's status through marriage, but because they have to avoid certain certain people, especially people within their um, cousin level, right? Or, I mean, you cannot marry, um, it's consanguinity level, it's six degrees. Right? So this is marriage ties again? Marriage ties, yeah. Among the exam passers? Among the exam passers. So not, and not, so just marriage, not, not, not father to son. Oh, including father to son. Including father to son. So in the case of, say, uh, Ego to father and father is connected by marriage to someone else, it shows up. Right? It's different le levels. Right? Uh, another way I try to visualize is because, uh, I mean, this, this giant ball is it's not very helpful, right? So I try to look at it in different perspectives. So in this one case, I removed the marriage ties. And I end up something like this. Right? So another way of thinking about the Yangban, uh, and interestingly, Cytoscape has this uh, plugin that tells us how many networks exist in this, this graph here. So the largest component has 40 nodes, and go, it counts down from there. And you see that there are 2,248 distinct uh, agnatic groups, so father to son networks, right? And these 2,248 over the period of, in this case, 200 years, they're connected by maybe about another 2,000 marriage links, right? So that was another way of picturing what is a young one, the first 200 years of the dynasty. I don't know, just sorry, I <laughs> have no idea about this basic theorizing. So what, what is this, how do you connect the first sheet? It's a giant ball, and what, what, what's the significance of this? So when you have a father to son as well as uh, ego to son-in-law, right? You have this giant ball, right? So I wanted to see uh, what are the, the, the smaller components that make that ball, right? So I removed all the marriage ties. So in this case, uh, so one reason this is useful is because uh, uh, the technique we tended to use with the Munga database, the, the civil exam database, is, uh, uh, is tabulation, it's aggregation. So you get a category like um, uh, a surname, 
with a colonym, right? So you have a surname plus your ancestral seat, right? Then you kind of aggregate it together. Oh, 600 Andong Guans passed the exam, right? And that's it, right? But I think there's, uh, we can go one level deeper, which is to say uh, within the same family, there are actually five different segments and their performance and their, the way they marry, they're all distinct. And they almost act like independent units. Right? And this shows that there are actually 2,248 independent components in that giant ball. Right? <laughs> and they're linked to each other by marriage. Right? And I can start investigating those 2,000 marriage connections as well. Right? But to, to me, that was very interesting. Right? And in this case, uh, the red dots signify by um, uh, exam degree. So this was very neat because I actually researched this family before. It's the Kwangju E family. And you find that, uh, how many do they have? This was the largest, this was the 40 the largest of the, yeah. of the, of the, with the 40 team. members, right? And you see that they have all these red dots with exam degree. They're the best performers. And this actually was shown by uh, just old-fashioned empirical research. There are several books written about this family. But then there are other families that are less well, uh, not as well-known, and uh, they show up in this network. Right. So each of those lines is a, is a father-son father -son relationship? Only. Yeah, father-son only. So, so, this is, right. so this is all time. This is time is, in theory, you could reconstruct the timeline of this, but this is all time. This is a this is a synchronic structure. A synchronic structure. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, if you are two degrees removed, you're talking about grandfather to father to son. So it doesn't include a son-in-law. It's a man, a man who married your partner. Yeah. Right. If you include that, then you get that giant component. Right. right? They're connected to each other. Is there, I mean, not, we don't have to go through it, but you know, are there equally illuminating leads when you take out the father to son relation and just concentrate on the marriage networks? Or does that, that as well. or does that become just a bunch of dyads? I, I can show you. I am not yet sure what to make of it. <laughs> because it seems like that would give you what is the connective tissue yeah. of these. When you just isolate that one, So there are a few. Yeah. There are a few young ban who chose the right marriage partners for their children, right? Like these guys, right? I'm not yet sure what to make of it. I need to go into the individual cases and see what they were doing. In this case, if you have okay, in in the case of. Uh, father-son relationships, if you have a line with three dots on it, that's a grandfather, father, and a son. Right. Uh, what do you get when you have three dots on a line of marriages? Because you can't see the question. It means that uh, for, your, for your child or for your daughter, you pick the right son-in-law. And the son-in-law is part of a family that also picks good marriage partners. But quite literally, who are the if you, yeah, you who have are the dots person A, person B, person C, is one a father, and the next one is a daughter, and the next one is a son-in-law, and the next one is a daughter, and the next one is a. Although there, there's no daughter represented here, there's no daughter represented here. So only equal to son-in-law. Oh, so, so the daughter is inferred. This is how the genealogy is self-destructed, and I followed it. So it's son-in-law, son-in-law, son-in-law. Son -in -law. I have a question about interpreting sort of visually the the, the one about the young man houses in the 1400s. Because um, I was thinking, so if the solid lines are father to son, and yet I think there's an instance of where you have one sort of cycle, where you have sort of a, a circle, like what does what, what does that actually mean? I was trying to picture it because I thought it would only be sort of 
a tree-like structure because, you know, that's what I expected too when I oh. first began the project. <laughs> and I started seeing those rings. Yeah, so what did the rings mean, I think? I mean, what? My gut feeling, I need to investigate it. Okay. My gut feeling has been that uh, they're avoiding mm -hmm. uh, certain partners because of proximity to their family, right? But they're still coming back in a loop. Okay. Right? There's this eagerness to marry within their in-group, but they also want to avoid certain people who are too close to them. Got it. That's my suspicion, right? There's something I want to... I want to really work with a mathematician or a social scientist to explore this further. But I, 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 I can't answer that question yet. But I think in terms of sort of like just genealogy, if somebody's, you have your father, then your son, and then your son, like, how can then the son then be the father, like, to form a ring? That's sort of what I was trying to figure out. Oh, they don't always go in one direction. This is directed graph, right? Oh, okay. So they can meet as well. Okay. At a certain point. Yeah, it's a gemini. Okay, got it. Yeah. And that's why you get the ring as well. Oh yeah. <coughs> you have two trains going like that, and then in the fifth generation, they, they marry. somebody gets married, and all of a sudden there's, that's a, right. there's yeah. a loop. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. I did work with a computer scientist. We had this uh, proof of concept thing. He wrote a script that uh, extracted those connections, the rings, right? Yeah. The, the the nodes that have uh, these these rings that that come together. But uh, we need to go further than that. We just wrote a script to extract those components, but we haven't done much in terms of research with them. Yeah, I think you're building toward another conclusion that I don't want to distract you from. But I was just curious, comparing these two graphs, if you could speak just really quickly about the one in the Koryo period, the 1100s graph. Uh, this is a sort of about royal in-law family royal in law family and its connection to other noble families, right? So I was just curious if you could speak really briefly about if we put the royal family in this picture again in the 1400s, would we actually see similar dynamic, or does that dynamic kind of change? Uh, very similar to the dynamic that we see. Okay, so that this dynamic is consistent, even when we get through like in law Because family. the royal family itself is getting its own rules. Okay. They're actually the, the, the best performers. <laughs> And also, in a way, because they have so many children, the royal family has so many children, and they are getting really good education. And the, the, the chance of getting degrees is much higher than those other families. So the colors go from one to the other. I mean, it's red royal family in 1400 as well, or is oh, no, it and with no connection? Oh, yeah. okay. May I now go back to the, the giant ball? Yes. <laughs> That's really interesting. So the those who are not within this giant ball, they are exam passers still. They're still exam passers. Yeah, do you think that they're not aristocratic, they're not including the young fund? That means somehow in the first 70s, this a little bit of lower group could take the exams and then somehow pass the exams. So I think uh, that's what we're, this is a network version of that hypothesis that we had through aggregation, through uh, the calculations of, uh, of NUFA data. So what we discovered is that after year 1600 or so, there are fewer and fewer new surnames that show up in the database. Right. And I think this is a network version, network graph version of that that shows that they are actually not being able to enter this giant ball and get attached by marriage. But they're not, they they didn't, the they, they're not attached to the marriage ties, but they still perform well. These, uh, in these civil examinations. That means exam examinations still has some kind of function of social mobility. So that is really challenging the idea. But in a way, when you investigate those uh, specific cases, a lot of them don't become high-ranking officials. There's a, li there's, a, there's a limit to what they can do. In a lot of cases, they don't even show up in the, in the court records, from my experience. Sure, you have a narrative to get back to, but one thing maybe you don't have to answer this now, but I'm curious. I'll be curious for this at the end of the Q and A. Is there a way to uh, animate this and actually fold back time into this question? Because using the hairball and the giant ball and what's under it, you could easily imagine that this top one is permuting, and in fact, every now and then one of these disconnected groups gets whoop, 
sucked up into it because through marriage, and then if you, you would watch it get more and more robust, perhaps because it gets tapped into this marriage network and re and social reproduction framework, and then other ones could be ejected from this um, and fall back fall down into this kind of miscellaneous, but pretty you know towards the top you have a very very robust outsiders, but then at the bottom just this chaff of exam can exam any exam you know exam passers, but that are not in not connected. Is it possible? I mean, does does it does does your work? I imagine since it has a time dimension, in theory, that could be visualized. I played with uh, animation before, and I just found it very very confusing. Uh -huh. And uh, I might try it. I might give it one more shot. But I'm of the opinion that time should rep to be represented in, in 2D and not in, as an animation. I want to show it as a process. Maybe I can uh, give it uh, uh, x, y co uh, coordinates so that if it belongs to a certain year, I want them to be grouped in uh, you know, a particular uh, space. Right? So 1400, 1500, 600, you can see them in they're different permutations. But animation, I just found it not be terribly useful. It's also tricky to publish, right? <laughs> it's very easy to miss things. They just disappear. Two seconds, they're gone. Right? So um, I guess I'll talk a bit about uh, the rationale for pursuing this uh, uh, these approaches uh, using these graphs here. This is a different approach because uh, so far I talked about the people involved in the intellectual history, right? But I also wanted to get back to the writings themselves, right? So in the case of Korea, we have the collected works of famous figures. Uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the period before the year 1900, right? And for the period of 1392 to uh, the early 1600s, we have about 200 odd collected works of the most famous figures, right? So what I wanted to do, and uh, when I wrote the DH Asia abstract, I was overly ambitious, and I said I want to get the whole thing and do text analysis, topic modeling, and I didn't get to that, right? Um, I just extracted a fraction of it, so I estimate that there are about, from the 200 collected works, we can get about 7 million characters. And I got about 2.4 million characters out of it so far. And based on that, I ran some analysis, but I didn't really get uh, interesting results so far. Right? Maybe if you talk to me again around this time next year, I'll have something to show you. We'll, we'll deduct it from your honorary. <laughs> <laughs> I only delivered two out of the three things I promised in the abstract, right? Wait but, I, yeah. but I did get this, right, which was really fascinating because uh, I do have some data now, right? So I thought, OK, uh, we have these collected works, right? And are there people who are overrepresented, right? And if you work with networks, this is a very common problem. Uh, we see this happening time after time. So I did. Uh, three different approaches. Okay. So in this case, it's long one. It's very hard to read. It's also very tricky to print. Right. This is about 200 plus collected works. Right. So I got the authors, and I figured, okay, I'm using a different approach using digital humanities methods. Right. But how about the the conventional way? Right. Which is to get uh, get an individual do a case study. So I went to the, the largest article databases in Korean studies, and I thought, OK, because a lot of the critics of digital humanities approach, they say, no, you're not really looking at the writing. Right? So I figured, OK, then in that case, the old-fashioned way, case studies of individual authors. How are we doing it? Right? And I got this like, remarkable power law graph right, that shows that there are about, I don't know, like a few authors here that receive the most attention. And then there's this long tail of ones and twos and zeros. Right? So we have 200 plus collected works over a span of about 200 years. And overwhelmingly, this intellectual history is written 
on the basis of what we know about these few figures here. Right? There's another interesting problem they discovered using this uh, this text data set is that uh, there's this one guy, right? If you know Korean intellectual history, you might guess that this guy's name is Yi Tuege, <laughs> the most famous Confucian philosopher of uh, the Joseon dynasty, right? And you see that the number of post works and the number of characters represented in this data set is, is just enormous, right? So what we have here is that in this uh, text database, we have this, uh, with this remarkable bias, right? Because if you compare each Tege's work, right, we're talking about, I don't know, 800 plus prose pieces alone, essays, right? And when you get down to some of the, the smaller collected works, we're talking about, you know, fewer than maybe like 20 or 30 at most, right? And this becomes a, an issue of like, what, what exactly are we doing, right? We're overrepresenting certain figures in, in a way that is like this, right? And in some sense, this is a reflection of the fact that there was a mediation going on because some people became famous and I don't know, there was something going on uh, in terms of uh, the domestic politics that some of the figures have a great number of students that was really good at preserving the writings of their master. And then there are others who didn't have that kind of luck. And our history continues to perpetuate the same bias over and over again. Right? Uh, this is actually a problem I wanted to pursue. I'm not yet sure what to do about it. Right? Uh, but there is another thing I want to do, which is uh, which has to do with the beauty of databases in general. Right? Uh, one of the beauties of the databases is that uh, if you learn something about databases, you learn that databases can be linked and databases can be transformed. So if you're used to say, for example, XML, <coughs> you will learn also XSLT, right? You take a certain XML structure and you, using an XSLT style sheet, you transform it into a different shape, a, a different uh, database structure, right? And if you learn how to build relational databases, you learn that once you have a, a, a data tables, you can create uh, uh, index indices and link it to other data tables. So what I wanted to do is take advantage of this, and once I have the data, a text data set extracted, I wanted to link this up with Chinese textual sources. Because if you recall the, uh, the map I showed you earlier, right, this, this intellectual movement happened in Korea for a, have a direct link with movements going on in China. Right? So I wanted to link up in the future these data sources and see the flow of certain ideas from, say, in Guangdong or in Jiangxi to Myeongnam area. That's kind of like a future plan. Oh, yeah, because I'm really ignorant of what's going on. So I can say that Tege, in the secondary materials, you know, it's really overrepresented. I understand it. So the preservation of the original texts in you know, Tege was really high, and yes, there yes. was a bias. Then. I mean, this is the fact. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. you you can do something else, you know, given this bias, and then you you want to connect this data set with these Chinese. Well, these are it's a separate issues. Separate so, issues. but when I do use it, I'll, I'm gonna be aware that this is happening. Mm -hmm. This is something that we need to take into consideration when we run the algorithms. Is there also? So this is something you need to take into consideration when running the algorithm so that you don't inadvertently just have a selection bias, but is there also an opportunity to look at the a visualization of the conventional approach of, of canonicity and then, who cares, um, to then say, okay, let me go find one of these overrepresented individuals in my network, and then ask the question about whether or not the net, whether or not a network analytical approach would have even suggested the total centrality and total importance of that individual, or in fact, or counterintuitively, find someone that the network suggests is actually quite central to a story, but you find him over here. Um, that seems to be one of the powers of... Really in a way of approaching this, this, this problem. Because uh, what we have is this, I don't know where I drew that, I had 
a timeline that has shown those different schools of Confucian thought, right? There are like, I don't know, I can go down to about like, 10 or 15 of them, right? The thing is that that reconstruction uh, was made through empirical research of specific influential figures. But we're not exploring them as a social movement, even though we have the sources, even though we have these networks. And I wanna, I wanna have a, develop a better sense of these people as communities, and these communities on a timeline that change over time. There are figurations and processes involved in, in, in the process. So of the unit of analysis is not the individual. The unit of analysis is the it's individual a within a, in a group. So that's an assemblage. Assemblage. And the what I found really fascinating about this approach uh, is that we, in in historical research, a lot of times we tend to be fixated on um, actors categories, as if these communities always come up with a term terminology for what they're doing, right? And and sometimes uh, we we privilege it so much that we uh, uh, we uh, affix this label that was. And that was coined in the year, say, 1100, on a phenomenon going on in the year 1300, just because it's written in Chinese. <laughs> but what I discovered is that through this approach is that a lot of these communities actually don't give a label to what they're doing. A lot of times, a label is given uh, retroactively by other historians in a much later period, just not a modern historian, maybe an 18th, 19th century historian, <laughs> looking back and giving a label to these communities. But I want to discover communities that got forgotten, didn't have these followers in later periods, right? And also uh, approach them in a way that's, you know, we don't have to give a name to them. Maybe we can give a name to them once we're done with the studies, right? But we can discover these groups, right? and when we can study them. So because you do intellectual history, there is an established argument on the factions in the Joseon dynasty. These factions are somehow created by philosophical differences, the factions are somehow just based upon later on networks as well. So they have philosophical differences, they have different canons, different major figures, and then their marriage ties are connected. Yeah. So somehow this network, is there any way that you could just sort out the... This so uh, I started <coughs> in a way. That was the, the farthest I could go, given the, uh, given the schedule. But once I go post 1608, I think I suspect the factions will start to show up. But I, I can't visualize anything. But what I did discover is that in the in the late 1500s, and I did, did this one this morning because I, I just got curious and if I had some time at my desk, so I drew this. So sinuscale, just like FE, you can assign a longitude latitude coordinates. So uh, I <coughs> wanted to visualize uh, marriage patterns on the base of their address. So this big ball, it's not really a ball, is an edge, a self-looping edge, representing the capital. So there's this large number of people based in the capital Marrying other people based in the capital, right? And there are some marriage connections across provinces, but most of them happen between <coughs> somebody from a, a province, a southern province, to the capital. And you can aggregate it to a province level. This is a town level. When I get to province level, this pattern becomes more clear. It looks something like this. So we also know that actions are regional, right? People That's in the nice. capital, yeah. Yeah, but you, it's, yeah it's this big ball, right? <laughs> They're marrying each other. Uh, but of course, uh, within the capital, we have about, about three or four factions, right? And that's another poss uh, recent possibility that we can begin to see uh, uh, faction as a phenomenon. So why does it happen? Why? How do we get from 1100 to 1400? So you've established these 
through alternate means have established that these are we have that somehow our explanation has to get from point A to point B. These are this is point A and point B. We we if to the extent that everyone in the room believes you, then something has transformed. Is are all the chains of causality those that con that contemporary historiography gives us, or is there a different story that comes up from? Yeah. So what I found is actually one of um, it's going to be one of the things I want to discuss today. Um, in these uh, competition approaches, it wasn't just a matter of uh, doing empirical research. In a way, uh, it became an, an exercise in doing historiographical inter intervention. Right? I mean, I don't want to go into the historiography itself, right? Uh, I don't think we'll be interested in that, right? In, in, in this crowd, right? But uh, uh, in a way, uh, you brought up aristocracy, bureaucracy, these kind of terminologies, right? These are terminologies that were brought up uh, during the Cold War. So what happened in, in, in a nutshell, what happened in Korean historiography is that empirical research is showing one thing, but the, 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 the historiography comes from the 1960s. And they don't go together. But we're kind of forcing them to work together. So what I'm finding is that I have this body of empirical research. I respect it. I tend to accept it. And it actually goes really well with what I see here. But the historiography has to be updated in a way that has to be tossed. With a new one that I think is uh, that's, that's does justice to these complex processes, right? these communities that you see, these, these possibilities of using computing power to do research. right? And the fact that South Korea, in, in, since uh, 1998, has been investing so much in digi digitization of cultural heritage. It is a leading ICT nation, right? It is digitizing aggressively, right? And uh, we have just like abundance of databases. They're called national DBs, and there are more than 70 of them that have to do with pre 20th century sources. This is the envy of a lot of the humanities fields, right? You go to, you speak to uh, somebody in French literature, and they go like, oh yeah, Korean literature, I have almost 99% digitized. It's just crazy, right? But we're not, we haven't figured out how do you make uh, take advantage of these resources, right? So what I'm trying to do is that not only uh, using these tools to see what kind of patterns we can discover, but start to think about what new historiography can we come up with that is more reflective of the year 2016. Because what we're operating on in, in, in most of the field is there are questions from that come from 1960s. And we're, we continue to use these concepts that are in more than 50 years old. And I don't want to be restricted to concepts either. Because it becomes a, a, a debate over the definition and the semantic itself. Right? I think there's something deeper going on. Right? There's, like, there's a great saying by, uh, so, uh, <coughs> I'm sure it's my, my Chinese cultural hero. Right? <laughs> so there's a great saying by Su Shi that says, uh, uh, I don't really care about names. I care about reality. Right? And I, I don't think that I'm accessing reality itself. Right? But I think there is something uh, in a different uh, level of abstraction than just language. And I'm trying to get at that using, um, using software tools and data sets. Um, so I wanted to ask, I guess, a somewhat related question. So right now, most of the visualizations that we see have, are actually representations of a very formal type of relationship that then leaves the document behind, which is marriage. Right? Um, but I assume as an intellectual historian, you realize that there are obviously other types of connections that can exist between individuals. Yeah. Um, they can be sort of like, you know, merit, uh, patronage, or you could say maybe one is the student of another. Um, I wanted to ask, is Korea, I guess, in, in this time period, is it the case that, you know, the most significant relationship is in fact merit? And if not, will you be updating sort of these diagrams with other types of connections that might show you know, perhaps it will draw in all the little free radicals into the big ball, or you'll see a different type of, you know, thickness between <coughs> different nodes coming up. So you gave me the perfect segue to explain oh, my, my highlight, <laughs> which was completed um, just last Tuesday, right? Uh, I was very worried because I, I spent so much time on it, and this was just not happening. So there were all these problems with the software, I had to tweak things, right? And finally, when I, when I got it made, I, I mean, I got so emotional. <laughs> it was like three in the morning, so late at night, and I spent 
weeks and weeks, in a way, this was like a product of, I don't know, like about five or six years of work, right? And I was, it was just beautiful because I didn't expect something like this. I expected connections, but I didn't expect connections like this. So what this represents is basically a giant component earlier, right? And from there, I added, uh, you'll learn this on Thursday, right? I added uh, properties to each node. And in, this is, in a way, uh, the historian doing interpretation. Right? So I added an attribute, which was basically, um, and this was made possible because uh, Korean historical sources are annotated. So the call records are annotated. So I get a full list of all the people who serve in certain offices as a list through text annotation. So I extracted that. And the reason, uh, the way I can justify this category is that in the year uh, 1400s and 1500s, there was a, an informal title given to you if you were the most respected Confucian scholar of the time. Right? It's called, uh, in English, I, I call it chief academician. In Korean, it's Nino. Right? And there's an informal title given to somebody who was <coughs> occupying, uh, in, in, in the Confucian bureaucratic terms, rank three and above in three major uh, institutions responsible for promotion of culture and education. Right? And the interesting thing about this is that uh, it's an informal title, but you have to meet those requirements. And then, and then you have a, a council of other academicians who decide, are you qualified to be called this informal title? Right? But what I did here is basically, in that giant component, the green dots here are people who are qualified, uh, who have the qualification, the prerequisite to be recognized as chief academician, right? And using Cytoscape, I'll show you this on Thursday as well, I moved just one node distance right, and extracted that network. Okay. Is this making sense? So there are people who are all tied by um, father-son and father uh, and eagle son in law relationship, right? And from there, from the giant component, I only got these, I think about maybe uh, about 200 figures who met the qualification requirements. And I moved one node distance in the selection um, command, right? And I extracted it, right? And I noticed that all these people were connected to each other. And the fascinating thing is that this section here, right, is basically a, a smaller version of what you see here, because I had the same question about chief academicians, right? So I knew who these people were, the six most famous figures. So the, and the reason I ended up drawing this is because I knew those six people by name. They show up all the time, right? If you do intellectual history of 15th century, you cannot miss them. So I wanted to see were their families connected, and I ended up with this, right? And in the larger database, I didn't do this. It was unsupervised in a way, right? So they show up here. And now I'm discovering that there's actually a larger connection that I didn't see before. It was just amazing to me to discover that. So this that is bigger than this? I mean, sorry, I'm yeah. very yeah. ignorant. So what's, what does the long line signify? So is this, it bigger uh, than this marriage ties? Or what that was done using genealogies. Okay. So that came from, I know the empirical research, I know the names, I wanted to see the extended families and see how they're connected. This, I didn't have that intervention at all. This is straight out of the exam database. And I see the same network in a smaller, in a smaller scale. So, so you created this, you, you created this with a starting point that was conventional historiography. These are people yeah. you knew, they're the classics, they're the canon, and then you use DH methods to create that diagram. But that diagram came out of Actually, if you let through an unsupervised model in which this shows up again, but something that you wouldn't have arrived at yeah. through a conventional set of. Because it would have never occurred to me that I should add these families' genealogies into the data set. Right? This was just a much larger data set of exam passers. And I discovered it. And now, if I want to, I can. Uh, click on the, each node and see which family they belong to, find their genealogy, and create another version of this that's much more extensive. 
So what's the implication? Does this chip activation have a, the network of that has a, the broader space, broader than planet networks, or what overlapped at the same time didn't overlap? What's this? What's this? What so does it from the, here, I think it goes back to your original question about what does marriage signify, right? I think marriage, uh, so my postulate throughout has been that Yangban is about receiving patronage from somebody already in power, and then a patron secures the tie through marriage. And what this shows is that people who were occupying the same offices and work together for extended period end up having marriage bonds. A very similar people operating in similar circles, similar literary circles, writing similar prose styles. We can investigate all these things further uh, now that we see these connections. So that office was like a young bond Tinder. That's yeah, where they, that's where they. Right. <laughs> okay. A specific type of young bond who are the most, uh, I wanted to bring this up, but it, was, it got really tricky. But uh, that neoclassical Cuban Confucianism is a type of Confucian learning that privileges people who are extremely gifted. And these, in a way, are people who saw each other as the most gifted people in, in the country. Right? And they all marry to each other. There are other young ones who are not so. Uh, smart people can get married. <laughs> smart people can marry smart people. Okay. But not all young ones were smart, right? <laughs> but, we're, we're, but we're they're also the ones that are calling each other smart. <laughs> they're determining whether or not each other are smart and deciding that they should marry them. Yeah. They call smart. each other cultural heroes. We're the heroes that will rescue this country and you know make it the most brilliant, something that competes with China. We can write better prose in the Chinese, saying these kind of things. I was, I'm not very good at being drafted, it's kind of far away, um, but I was wondering, what, are, what did the, um, the big graph, what did the lines between the different nodes represent? So, others respond. Okay. 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 So when you say you moved one node, it means that you were looking at person X who married person Y. And you thought, well, let's just add Y to the mix and see what happens. Is that, is that just, what you yeah, think? Just, just move one distance and see just one connection. OK. Yeah. That's it. I tried two, and it just became another giant component. We kind of the expression, it's not what you know, it's who you know. This seems mm -hmm. like a very elaborate way of proving that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And this is, that always uh, comes back to the dismissal of BH, as <laughs> if we would if we already knew this. I don't know. I don't know. That's the part that. Would yeah, but you yeah, kind, but that, but that you kind of have to go through what you know in order to get start pushing the doors open where you don't know. Right, right. And and some of the other research projects he's talking right. about would do that. But if someone were to have arrived at that, having spent 20 years reading through textual materials, would we have said that they arrived at a conclusion we already knew? Or would we be in uh, awe of those 20 years? <laughs> I really do think that there's an element of... of we were talking about this at lunch. Yeah. yeah. So, so just to build that, just so then in in the giant ball, in the um, you went in and started to add attributes, and one of them was this chief academician title. So then within the, within the ball, some some of these very small number of nodes in it have that attribute, and then to produce that, you said, okay, I want. The, net, the network that I want to extract has those that it has to have those nodes and those attributes, and then add one step, yeah, and then so it could have been it could have ended up all fragmented. It could have, but I it didn't. almost expected that. Expected it, but then it turned out that just by saying just give me those green dots, and give me one order of removed, it actually produced a connected system. Mm -hmm. There's like a one long connected networks, and there are several other pretty significant connected components as well. What's the left-right thing? Is, is uh, there any relationship between the stuff? No, this is just right? synchronic. No time. No, I'm talking about, I mean, we have essentially two columns on that paper. Yeah. Is, is one the elongated hairball, and then there's a series of smaller hairballs, and then we get down? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, so, for someone to get the title of chief academician, 
he said that they had to achieve um, titles in three different areas. Three different, no. Could you tell me how someone got, got that title? So he had to be the director of uh, Song Ming Wan National Academy, mm -hmm. the University of Still Exists in Korea. He had to be the, uh, the director, the, sort of the top position in um, the literary office in Myanmar. And uh, third one is Hong Mong Kwan, which is the, uh, the office of for the promotion of culture. And you're entitled, you're in charge of uh, writing edicts for the king. Okay, and, and access to those three, three sort of institutions for better, for, um, access to that wasn't open to everyone. So there, there, there would have been nepotism going on just to be able to have access to be given that Not title. Not just that, but um, you need to have certain so to receive patient rate, you have to be recognized by another uh, very important person who saw your writing and thought, okay, you're worthy of this title. And you get sponsored into that office. So it's a bit like access to the Royal Academy in Britain. Very similar. I call it National Academy. It's very similar wow. to the Royal Academy concept. Right? You have access to certain books, the Royal Library, right? books that uh, if you live in, you know, in the southern province, you have no access to. So no wonder you have a distinct intellectual culture that develops right, as a result of that. Does, doesn't that raise an implication of whether or not the green is the cause of that shape or the outcome of that shape? So are, are, are all those greens connected because all the greens got together and they began to marry and create that, um, which it seemed to be the implication of what you had first said? But then I think this raises a question that if the three qualifications to even become eligible to be green on this on this can't come out of processes that would have been aided by a already existing network and marriage, that the green comes second and the network comes first. But the network has to the network is you, you see what I think that's the implication. Yeah, that's is it I mean so it's sort of a, a chicken and egg network and Chief Academician, <laughs> the lesser known chicken and eggs. I mean, are you surprised <laughs> that in order to be given that title, that someone needed to be known by other members, or did you already know that? Is it known so within the in the In the existing literature, yeah. uh, we knew about uh, this, right? So here, the Chief Academicians are marked by the red dots. I knew who they were. And in the studies, they say, oh, yeah, so uh, Papa John's maternal grandfather is from the thing. OK. And then I saw that, oh, and another guy, Choi Han, is uh, his uh, brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. So you just see the references. And I thought, is there something happening at a much larger scale? Right? But I didn't expect this. Right? <laughs> I think they're all engaging in a very similar But if we, I mean, to some degree, that's a you scratch money back, I'll scratch yours, or you support me, I'll support you type of office, I would think. But if you have other offices that were more um, connected with policy decisions, whether financial or military or political, I wonder how the patterns would change. You'd have you'd have a lot of the same people involved, right? Maybe they were all be on the right there. Yeah, so. Because they didn't just serve in those offices, they were moving around yeah. in offices, right? So some of these names will show up in the sensor, it will also be censored, right? Uh, but I haven't visualized them. But you may see more factionalism and hostility between factions that would prevent some of those links. Uh, in this period, we don't yet see factional divisions. We see more like a capital versus province divide thing. Oh. Post sixteen away, we begin to see factional divisions, and that will get really interesting. Yeah, but I don't have the data set right now. Okay. So the format you broke our VHA changing format. It's wonderful. No, no, like we're sitting in different ways and looking at paper, and we kind of had Q and A with the talk, uh, and. It's up to, I would say it's up to you, me, and Javier decide how you want to bring this plane in for the landing. If you want to, I mean, I don't know if your questions already incorporated the thoughts you were 
going to put forward or but we have about we have about 15 16 minutes remaining um, this is this is nice a nice scramble it's amazing <laughs> it's amazing and then um, because I'm really ignorant of the methodology it's really difficult to really really sharply engage with the findings that you uh, but by by reading your outlines, but I think the outline is totally different from what you're presenting. Yeah, so exactly. I think this is useless. So the question that I had over time is: so these data, uh, there's a lot of possibilities, but still somehow all these findings are really changing the historiography. You mentioned you're really you want to just uh, uh, have you find a lot lot of problems in the existing uh, historiography and it's a causal production. Somehow you need to when you want to suggest something findings uh, that was not entirely kind of restrained by this historiography, but th I think there are some areas that you really need to really uh, very really 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 uh, think about the uh, the concepts and the yes. historiography as well. And then these findings, I don't, I'm not sure whether or not you really change the Characteristics of young band historic, like young band, you know, in the early uh, early person period. What what are what do you think that your findings? What are the main findings that you really change the characteristics, our understanding of young band system, in the first uh, half of the Joseon dynasty? Oh yeah, that's that's a great question. I'm a very nonlinear thinker, so it's not. So, but I had an outline, and but I if uh, if I'm not reading the paper, I, I end up doing this. <laughs> I apologize for that. No, no, no. It's a great question. So, uh, I want to just demonstrate. Uh, this is a uh, the list that we get in uh, John Duncan's research is about uh, the early part of Goguryeo Dynasty, right? And it's a list of all the the prominent Yangban families. That appear in the records, right? Uh, and when you are in the historiography, if you're discussing whether uh, uh, Koryo was Buddhist and aristocratic and Joseon is more modern, bureaucratic, and Confucian, uh, you kind of miss the point of uh, the processes involved, right? And what was going on and what was the difference over time, over this, we're talking about five or six centuries. Uh, so what I did is I took John Duncan's uh, list. This is just tables, right? List of names, surnames, right? And I began to see um, the names that appear here in the first uh, 150 <coughs> years. What happens in the year 1300? They disappear. Right? So people who talk about continuity or change, is it aristocratic or bureaucratic transition? These are very uh, I mean, I'm discovering now that this is a Cold War product. It's based on Tucker Parsons' reading of Max Weber. Okay, There's a stability. Yeah, okay. of stability, right? Uh, was there a possibility that Joseon was already quite modern, therefore he could achieve industrial development, right? And for me, I, I mean, in 2016, I don't think that's a major issue, right? I'm more interested in what are the assemblages, right? What are the processes, and why are people disappearing? <coughs> what is the politics? What is the power relation? Power structure. So, hopefully, uh, you were persuaded that you know there's a great concentration of power to a certain few families, mm -hmm. and when there's a conflict, because there's so much concentration of power to a small number of people, when they get eliminated, they have no offspring left. And I think that's what's going on here. Uh, all these families, very prominent families in the early part of the dynasty, they're gone by 1300. And what is very remarkable is that um, uh, families that went through this transformation in the late Korea into Yangwan, right? So one example is the uh, Yangdong Kwan family. We didn't have time to look at it, right? Um, so this is an example of a family that uh, came from the provinces. The, the Cyan means uh, they're in the province, right, as a local functionary. And red means that they're, they're achieving uh, Yangwan officials. They, they reached Yangwan officials. And what's interesting is that once they become Yangban, they begin marrying other Yangban. Right? And the exam database shows that once you get to that stage in the year 1400, right, 
and, and you have a new list. I don't have it ready here, but I did do the analysis. I have a spreadsheet somewhere in my hard drive. Um, when you get a list of the top performers in the year 1400s, in the, in the 15th century, right? And you see, you track their performance in the later periods of the dynasty, they continue to perform really well. So early Joseon dynasty really dramatic in the sense of uh, upward and downward mobility. Of I think so, yeah. And I do I mean, Duncan's main point was that the Korea to Joseon transition was uh, one of continuity, and I yeah. agree with him. But what's missing in that in the narrative is the the early Korea to late Korea transformation, which I think was uh, was transformative. And you're and you're saying that at the core of that is the later, in the later Chosun, the in essence the structure because of the way that the network decentralizes and becomes webbed in this. That in a certain sense, in family structures, it is far more resilient and able to reproduce itself socially over time in ways that the high concentration sort of network is is highly susceptible, highly vulnerable to. Episodic the stock market. Right. So you want to diversify your portfolio. Because right? right. if you have one misfortune, your family is gone. Right. But if you have a much more dispersed, uh, if your assemblage is uh, shaped in a way that's much more dispersed, right, you could have a few people in your household who face a misfortune, like you know, being accused of treason, getting executed, uh, you know, factional struggle. Still, you have other segments of your household that. Perpetuously. But that raises the question of a sort of a class in itself, a class for itself. Is in the beginning, at least by your narrative, they didn't do this. They didn't diversify their portfolio consciously in order to like make the, do the stock market. But maybe at some point it was for a variety of other reasons, and then maybe at some point in the story, it becomes a conscious social, social, political, economic strategy. Yes, we do need to diversify. But in the beginning stages, it stands to reason that it's not a pragmatic decision to start ensuring our social reproducibility, that that precedes the awareness of the possibility of using the network as it is to do that in, in a very, very effective way. And this is where Confucian ideas come in, because you begin to respect uh, the Confucian right of not marrying within 60 years of continuity and following Zhuqi's family of rituals. So once you begin observing that, you kind of uh, unintentionally start doing this. Of course, in the 1100s, we don't do that. How would you see St. Maria? <laughs> you know, but there's another dimension to this because uh, if you want to get to the, the, these are still social elite in the southern provinces that are not partaking the examinations, They're, they don't appear in the records, in, in my data set. Right? So this is a problem that in uh, last month in, uh, in UCLA, I actually wanted to bring this up. Last month in UCLA, right, um, we talked about how there are 325,000 articles on Twitter, right? And then at some point, people who are specialists in Twitter analysis, they began saying, are we actually studying the society or Twitter as a medium, right? This is the message of the medium. And they were of the opinion that a lot of these people are studying Twitter as a medium itself, right? And what I want to avoid doing is that I have this great database, right? But I have to also recognize that there are a lot of things missing there. So that the, my data set shouldn't be determined by the database structure of the Munga database or limited by what appears there. So yeah, I have to always begin with my research questions, right? Create database accordingly, right? And then sometimes I have to go outside my database and look for certain sources and link it up. Right? Because I can find the genealogies and link it to a Munga database. And discover new patterns that way. Yeah, I was going to suggest that you might want to look at things like uh, what the economic base of these families was. And if, uh, I mean, I think there's more going on here than marriage and assassination uh, <laughs> in terms of <laughs> defining the, sec the, the uh, success of the lineage. And uh, some of these, I mean, there may have, and here's my delimitation of my knowledge. I mean, there's Mongols going through the area also, you know, kid on, killing off people. But um, uh, at a certain point in the economic development or the economic 
context of, of East Asia, it, be, it probably became possible for some of these families to adopt the strategy that a lot of Chinese families in Ming and Qing op, uh, adopted consciously, and that was some of you are going to do business, some of you are going to take the examinations, and even very consciously sent the family on two tracks to each one having its own success and its own gear and its own uh, income, but also its own risks. But that was, you know, very consciously done. If these families did the same thing, they would also persist better than families had done earlier when either the economic opportunities weren't there or they hadn't figured it out. You bring up a very important point, and uh, it's a point that I deliberate, deliberately left out. Uh, in, 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 you know, in a way, because it makes it really complicated, makes things really complicated, but also it can be a bit controversial, right? Because a lot of these families are still very influential in, in South Korea, right? And uh, what I discovered in my research, and you'll find some uh, examples of it, and I, 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 I mean, I, I don't pull back any punches, I just say it the way mm -hmm. I see it, right? Uh, like for example, the Andong Kwon family, uh, Heng Ju Keys, right? Um, I mentioned that the, the top performers in the 15th century continue to perform well later on, right? But how did they get there? Right? Uh, it happened uh, during the Mongol rule. Uh, so what you see here, uh, it doesn't. The network itself doesn't make this very clear, but at least uh, if you look at this very carefully. Let me show it to you. This version here. This version here. You see, uh, you see, uh, the Yuan Emperor there. <laughs> okay. You find, uh, some Mongol names. Uh huh. And this is not exactly a you know fabricated source. This is a. I mean, I'll show you on Thursday if you come. If you come, uh, this is a data set I created using a 1465 edition of the Anding Guan genealogy. This is a legitimate source, right? Mm -hmm. And it mentioned Mongol names as son-in-law, right? And if you go into the, the anecdotes, right, you discover that a lot of these guys were more powerful than the Goryeo king because they had a patron in the Yuan capital. They had bigger mansions than the king's palace, right? Uh, they were extorting things. Uh, they were stealing people's slaves, uh, taking land, because they could do that, right? They, they were above the law, right? And I think a lot of them became so powerful because of that period, that, that 30, 40 year window where they were allowed to do this. Mm -hmm. right? And they, they enjoy, they continue to reap the benefits of that into the Joseon dynasty long after the Mongols uh, left Korea. Right. But so that would suggest that the powerful families of today owe their families to this collaboration with the Mongols. A lot of them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. On that note. <laughs> Thank you. Now you know why Korean dramas are so right. much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, uh, like the drama Kyuhangu, right? I mean, it's dramatized, right? The key family is the Hengju key family, actually. <coughs> yeah, there were all kinds of crazy stories about them. They, they were above the law. You know, they were, uh, uh, the sister was an empress in the Yuan dynasty. Right? And uh, when the family gets purged, the brother who was actually living with the sister, not together, but in the capital of the Yuan dynasty, uh, threatened to invade after he did invade Korea. So all kinds of things happening, right? But they weren't alone. There were, I know at least about 20 or 30 families that were doing this. And the ones that do survive the dynastic transition, <laughs> they, they remain as the most powerful young man.